Greetings, Michael DDA here. We are going through very slowly, I might add, uh, the book of Exodus. Uh, today we're going to make another 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, another five verses in Exodus. All the rest is going to be Yasher. There is nothing but an outline going on in Exodus. I'm very discouraged to see this, and I'm hopeful in the future that when some of the new documents come out that have been underneath the Vatican, that we're going to see how severely our Torah has been redacted, severely redacted, to the point where it's an outline at best. They leave out so many things. Well, you're going to see that today. Last week, Moses was born. Remember, Miriam had a prophecy. My father and my mother are going to have a child. And he's going to save Israel. And it was at that point, remember, he had already sent he a, a Abram, not Abram, uh, what is uh, his father's name? I'm spacing all of a sudden. Let me go look. Whoops. Exodus 2. Um, oh, they don't even Amram. give him it. Amram, thank you. Amram, yeah, you guys, really, if I can't get a name, please jump in. Amram took Yochavet and sent her away. She had Miriam, she had Aaron, and then the king made a proclamation that all the male children had to be thrown into the river. Really, he got the idea from Balaam. Balaam was the one who told him to do it because of a dream that he had. Well, Moses was born put into the river by his mom. Remember, he was uh, seven months. He was a preemie, born in seven months. Kept him in the house for another three months, but you can only keep a baby quiet for that long, for so long. And finally, she put him in the river when it was found out. She didn't put him in the river voluntarily. She found out that, that the king's people knew. And so she put him in the river, and it was... Um, Bathia, Bathia, uh, daughter of Pharaoh, who actually, Melel, remember that was his name, Melel, the Pharaoh, uh, she pulled him out of the river and adopted him. And then the last thing we talked about were all the names that he was given. And we don't need to go through those names. Uh, so we're going to go back to Yasher and pick up at 69. It says this, And the king of Edom died in those days, in the eighteenth year of his reign, and was buried in his temple, which he had built for himself as a royal residence in the land of Edom. What does that mean? Is this temple the residence? Is there a temple in the residence that he's buried in the temple? Maybe that's what it's saying. You know, I like, well, here, let me read the next verse, and then I'll tell you what I was going to say. Here it is. And Esau's seed sent to Pethor, which is upon the river. And they fetch from there a young man of beautiful eyes and comely aspect, whose name was Saul. And they made him king over them in place of Semla. I like how much information is given to us in Yasher that we can verify in Torah. Let's go to Torah, chapter 36 of Genesis. Look what it says here. This is very important to see this. 
These are all the kings, starting at verse 31, 36, 31. These were the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before the king reigned over Israel, before any king reigned over Israel's seed. The first one was Bela, son of Beor, reigned in Edom. Remember, Bela was Balaam's older brother. Well, we saw Yaakov, or Yavin, Yovan. Yovav, Yovav. We saw Cushim, we saw Hadad, we saw Samla, and now here is Saul. This says of Rehoboth by the river. You know, when they say by the river, I thought, well, what river are they talking about? Well, I found out, here, I think I've even put it in my note here. Look at this, as Easton said this, an ancient city on the Euphrates. Does it make sense that if we're going to talk about the river, the river, that it probably is going to be the Euphrates? I think so. It's the main river. It says, Rahabot, 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 by the river, by the river. Here, how did, where did it go? An ancient city in Rukavot. Yeah, so um, this says, what does it say? Saw uh, Pathor, sent to Pathor, which is upon the river. Now, this is one place where it's not agreeing. This says Rukavot. Rukavot, probably, yeah, Rukavot, by the river. But they're both by the river. And I got a hunch that the Euphrates is definitely the river that we're talking about. Remember, these people, Edom, take their leaders from all over the place. They don't take them from Edom. Israel takes their kings from Israel. The brethren rule over the brothers, rule over the brethren. Or a brother rules over the brethren. Well, Again, I like the continuity between Genesis and Yasher. We see it over and over again where we are confirming things. When it said uh, a daughter of Levi last week that Amram was taking, we saw in here that it was the daughter of Levi. And when we saw it was the daughter of Levi, we were able to go back to Torah. And in Numbers, we found a verse that said, he took the daughter of Levi, Yochavet. This is very important that we understand these things and pull these pieces together. You know, some may get tired of me emphasizing certain things. And I do this on purpose because I want you to see, like men, oftentimes I'll say men, men, men. Because I want you to see it's not about women. Nothing against the ladies. I love the ladies. I wish I had a lady in my life right now. But it's about the men. Men are the ones that go to war. Men are the ones who own the land. Men are the ones who own the servants. The house. Dare I say, look at the Tenth Commandment. The women. They are their possession. These are all important things. And when you start to get some of these things into your heart and into your mind, it's going to open the scriptures to you. So bear with me. Ask yourself, why does he call Israel seed? Seed. How come he doesn't call them the children of Israel? Or better. The sons of Israel, because they're not. Israel only had 12 sons. When we're talking about B'nai Israel, we're talking about all the spiritually born sons, not the flesh born sons, spiritually born sons from generation to generation that came after Israel. Not Jacob. Jacob's seed and Israel's seed can be two different people entirely. 
One is spiritually born. One is simply a son of the flesh, a relative. So these are things that you've got to get past. And so bear with me as I go through these because it's important to you. I want the best for you. I want you to see what the scriptures say and have it do to you what it did to me. It changed my life when I saw the duties and responsibilities for a man compared to the duties and responsibilities for a woman. They're not the same. A woman is not commanded to keep the commandments of Yahovah. What is she commanded to do? Your, your, your desire shall be for your man, and he shall rule over you. You know what? That is freeing. Because women today have been taught that they need to live as men. Well, that's pretty hard to do when you weren't created to do it. Do you follow me? So bear with me as we go. You know, we're, this is an adventure in Torah. We're exploring the scriptures. We're learning new things every week. And I try to bring a, some tidbits every week that I can bless you with. But you got to keep an open mind. So here's Saul. The Saul reigned over Esau's seed in the land of Edom for 40 years. I like how they take us. They're taking us chronologically for the most part. They're taking us chronologically through Torah, through our time in Egypt. And he died pretty much right after Moses. Remember, Moses was born in our 133 to 135 years. Oh, that's how old Jochebed was. So here's Moses now. Uh, just being pulled out of the river. So this is happening around the 133rd or 135th year of our being in Egypt. Now it says, And when Pharaoh, king of Egypt, saw that the council of Balaam had counseled, which Balaam had advised respecting Israel's seed, did not succeed, but that still they were fruitful and multiplied and increased throughout the land of Egypt. Remember, it was Balaam who said, they can't survive the water. You can put them in, you can burn them. You can do all these things to them. But they've never been tried by water. So you can save them. You can dip them in the water. And it didn't work. Okay, so it says, Then Pharaoh commanded in those days that a proclamation should be issued throughout Egypt. To Israel's seed, saying, No man shall diminish anything of his labor daily. And the man who shall be found deficient in his labor, which he performs daily, whether in mortar or bricks, then his youngest son shall be put in their place. And the labor of Egypt strengthened upon Israel's seed in those days. And behold, if one brick was deficient in any man's daily labor, the Egyptian took his youngest son by force from his mother and put him in the building in place of a brick which his father left wanting. And the men of Egypt, Egypt's men, did so to Israel's seed day by day for a, for days day by day, all the days for a long period. Here we are again. But the tribe of Levi did not at that time work for the Israelites, their brethren. From the beginning of Levi's seed, for from the beginning, Levi's seed knew the cunning of the Egyptians, which they exercised at first toward the Israelites. Well, they sound like the first conspiracy theorists, don't they? Yeah, they knew what the Israel what the Egyptians were doing. And the Egyptians were doing it. It wasn't a conspiracy theory, it was a conspiracy. Well isn't that what we're seeing right now? Okay. Now third year from the birth of Moses 
Like I said, Moses is about, Moses was born at 133 to 135. I can't get it any closer than that. Um, we know that we're leaving at 210 years and Moses is going to be 80 years old. So there's some fudge room in there to, to make things work out. They're not terribly specific about it. So Moses is now three years old. Pharaoh was sitting at, at a banquet when Alparanith, Ranit, the king, queen, was sitting at his right and Bethia at his left. And the lad Moses was lying upon her bosom. And Balaam, the son of Beor, with his two sons. Look at that. This is the first time that we're seeing Janice and Janie's, Jamie's. Uh, being mentioned in Torah or in Yasher. He had two sons with his two sons and all the princes of the kingdom were sitting at a table in the king's presence. Must have been a pretty big deal to have everybody all together like that at once. And the lad stretched forth his hand upon the king's head and took the crown from the king's head and placed it on his own head. How interesting. We have to ask ourselves, why is a story like this even being told? Is there a reason for it? You know what? I think it has to do with the providence that Yahovah has given to Moses that he is going to be the one that is going to bring Israel out. And here's a time where we're going to see that he comes near the chance of death once again. He's already survived it in the river. He survived it not being heard for the three months in his father's house. And now here again is death coming at his door. And when the king and the princes saw the work which the baby had done, the king and the princes were terrified. And one man to and one man to his neighbor expressed astonishment. And the king said unto the princes who were before him at the table, What speak you, and what say you, ye princes, in this matter, and what is to be the judgment against the boy on account of this act? Now Balaam, here he is jumping in, and Balaam, then be or. The magician answered before the king and the princess and said, Remember now, O Adonai and king, and the dream which thou didst dream many days since, and that which thy servant interpreted unto thee. Now therefore this, this is the child, the Yaladim, or the Yaled. Yaladim is plural, Yaled. From the Hebrew Yaladim, in whom is the spirit of Elohim. And let not my Lord, my Adonai and King imagine that this youngster did this thing without knowledge. For he is a Hebrew boy, and wisdom and understanding are with him, although he is yet a child. Now, is that right? Do you think that Moses did this on purpose? We're going to hear this man say a lot of things, and you've got to ask yourselves, is what he's saying true? Some of it is. Much of it isn't. And this is the course that we have to have in our lives. We have to think clearly. We have to discern what is truth and what is lies. Boy, we're really seeing it this day and age, aren't we? Well, they're doing it right here. And if we're not paying attention, we're going to think ill of Moses when this was an innocent mistake. Watch what happens. For he is a Hebrew boy, and wisdom and, and understanding are with him. Are they? Although he is yet a child. And with wisdom has he done this and chosen unto himself the kingdom of Egypt. Well, in a sense, you know, 
Moses is not going to be the king of Egypt, but he's going to be the end of Egypt as they know it eventually. For this is the manner of all the Hebrews to deceive kings and their nobles, to do all these things cunningly in order to make the kings of the earth and their men tremble. Does Israel see? Make the kingdoms of the earth tremble? Will they make the kingdoms of the earth tremble in the future? I think we're going to see that they will. So it's partially true. Surely thou knowest that Abraham, their father, acted thus, who deceived the army of Nimrod, king of Babel. Remember, we talked about that long ago. And Avimelech, king of Gerar, he possessed himself in the land of Hasid and all Canaan's kingdoms, and that he descended into Egypt and said of Sarah, his woman, she is my sister, in order to mislead Egypt and her king. Again, ask yourself, did they do this as a plot against the king? Or was Abraham deficient in his faith? And Yehovah worked through it anyway. See, this is what we got to see. His son Isaac also did so when he went to Gerar and dwelt there. And his strength prevailed over the army of Avimelech, king of the Philistines. He also thought of making the kingdom of the Philistines stumble. Was that what he was thinking when he said that Rebekah was his sister? Absolutely not. Again, deficient in faith. He was afraid. But Yehovah worked through his fear. Jacob also dwelt treacherously with his brother. And took his took from his hand his birthright and his blessing. Is that what happened? Was it not Esau who gave up his birthright for a bowl of porridge? Who was supposed to have the blessing to begin with? What was the prophecy that his mom received from? Shem and Eber concerning the birth of the twins. Remember, they said the younger is going to rule, or the elders, elders, younger is going to rule over the elder. No, the blessing was never supposed to be his. Yeah, he got the blessing. Yeah, he got the birthright, but it wasn't through treacherous, treacherousness. When he went to Padam Aram, to the house of Laban, his mother's brother, and cunningly obtained from him his daughters, his cattle, all belonging to him, and fled away and returned to the land of Canaan, his father. Was it cunningness? His sons sold their brother Joseph, who went down to Egypt, became a slave, and was placed in prison house for 12 years until the former Pharaoh dreamed dreams and withheld him and withdrew him from the prison house and magnified him above all the princes of Egypt on account of his interpreting his dream to him. And when Elohim caused a famine throughout the land, he sent and brought his father and his brothers and the whole of his father's household and supported them without price or reward and bought Egyptians for slaves. You know, this man knows a lot of history. But he kind of works it out so that it works in his favor, I think. Now, therefore, Adonai, king, behold, this yellow has risen up in the river, in, risen, risen up in their, where am I getting river? Uh, this child has risen up in their stead in Egypt to do according to their deeds. 
to trifle with every king, prince, and judge. If it please the king, let us now spill his blood upon the ground, lest he grow up and take away the government from thy hand. And the hope of Egypt perish after he shall have reigned. And Balaam said to the king, Let us moreover call for all the judges of Egypt and the wise men thereof, and let us know if the judgment of death is due this boy, as thou didst say, and then we shall slay him. And Pharaoh sent and called for all the wise men of Egypt, Egypt's wise men, and they came before the king. And messenger of Yehovah came amongst them, an angel came amongst them and he was like one of Egypt's wise men and the king said to the wise men surely you have heard what this Hebrew boy Yod who is in the ho- is in the house has done, and thus has Balaam judged in this matter. Now judge as you also now judge you also, and see what is due to the boy for the act that he has committed. Jeez, all he did was take the crown off his head and put it on his own head. She was that looks fun. And the angel, the messenger who seems like one of Pharaoh's wise men, answered and said as follows, before all Egypt's wise men, and before the king and the princes. If it please the king, let the king send for men who shall bring before him an onyx stone and a coal of fire, and place them before the child. And if the child shall stretch forth his hand to take the onyx stone, then we shall know that With wisdom has the youth done all that he has done, and we may slay him. But if he stretches forth his hand upon the coal, then thou shalt know that it was not with knowledge that he did this thing, and he shall live. And the thing seemed good in the eyes of the king and the princes, and the king did according to the word of Jehovah's messenger. And the king ordered an onyx stone and a coal to be brought before Moses. And they placed the boy before them. And the lad endeavored to stretch forth his hand to the onyx stone. But Jehovah's angel took his hand and placed it upon the coal. I don't think he did this physically. I think he did this. He made the boy do it made the boy choose the coal. And the coal became extinguished in his hand, and he lifted it up and put it in his mouth, and it burned part of his lips and part of his tongue. And he became heavy in mouth and tongue. Hear that? Moses put the coal, the hot coal, to his mouth, and it burned his hot mouth and his tongue. And it says he became heavy in his mouth and his tongue. Well, what does this remind you of? Look at Exodus 4.10. Then Moses said to Yehovah, Adonai, I am not elegant. No, it must be my, it must be Adonai. It must, uh, I am not elegant, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant. But I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Could this be the reason why Moses wanted Aaron to speak for him? I think it really is. Which is part of the reason for the story. Not to mention that Jehovah again is providing an escape for Moses. He's got to bring his word to pass. And when the king and the princess saw this, they knew that Moses had not acted with wisdom in taking the crown off the king's head. He's just a silly kid. And the king and the princes refrained from slaying the child of the yellow. So Moses remained in Pharaoh's house growing up, and Jehovah was with him. And whilst the boy was in the king's house, 
he was robed in purple, and he grew among the king's sons. Then Moses grew up in the king's house. Bethiah, the sister of the daughter of Pharaoh, considered him as a son. And all the household of Pharaoh honored him, and all Egypt's men were afraid of him. He daily went forth and came into the land of Goshen, where his brethren Israel's seed were. And Mo he daily, he went daily. Do you think he was going to see his mom and his dad? Do you think he may have been learning the ways of Yehovah when he was going daily? To the land of Goshen? I think so. And Moses saw them daily in shortness of breath and hard labor. And Moses asked them, saying, Wherefore is this labor meted out unto you day by day? Why is this labor meted out? And they told him all that had befallen them and all the injunctions which Pharaoh had put upon them before his birth. And they told him all the counsels of Balaam ben Beor. No, told him all the counsels which Balaam ben Beor had counseled against them, and what he had also counseled against him, Moses, in order to slay him, which he had taken when he had taken the king's crown off his head. And Moses heard these things. And when Moses heard these things, he was his anger was kindled against Balaam, and he sought to kill him. And he was in ambush for him day by day. Moses wants to take out Balaam. Now look what it says. And Balaam was afraid of Moses. He and his two and he and his two sons rose up and went forth from Egypt. And they fled and delivered their souls and betook themselves to the land of Cush, to Kikianus, king of Cush. Remember, Balaam was in Africa. Then he went to Katim, Rome. Then he went to Egypt. Now he's going to Cush. And you know where he's going to go when he leaves Cush? To Egypt. This man is an opportunist. But I had to ask myself, where is Cush? I asked myself that so many times. Do you remember when the million man army came against Egypt? Egypt went out with their 400,000 men and 150 Israelites. And Egypt withdrew. The Israelites chased the, the million man army away. Do you remember where they chased them to? Cush. We have to ask ourselves, where is Cush? Why Cush? Do you remember who Cush is? Let me share a couple things with you. Look at my note down here. It says Ham seed were Cush. Mizraim, Mizraim, put in Canaan. Those were his sons. Cush is Ham's firstborn. Now keep in mind that Cush, well, actually, it's going to say it down here. Uh, the sons of Cush. Who are the sons of Cush? Seba, Hamala, Sabta, Rama, and Seba. The sons of Rama, Rama, remember Seba had Rama. No, no, this is Cush. Yeah, this is even more important. Cush had Seba and Rama. Rama is going to have Sheva and Dadan. Remember, Cush in his in his old age begat Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one on the earth. You know, nobody knows that Taurus doesn't say anything about Put. Where is Put? Where is the land of Put? 
I've got an idea on where the land of Cush is. May I share that with you? Uh, you can decide whether you think I'm right or wrong. I think I found some things that, I don't know, may, may be what we're talking about. Let me go here, and I'm going to make this five so it spreads out. And we're going to come down here, and I can turn on political boundaries. Here's political boundaries. And look what I found. Here is Cush. This is below Egypt. Here's Egypt. Here's the Sinai Peninsula. Funny, it's called the Sinai Peninsula when Sinai is over here in Midian. But here's the Sinai Peninsula. Here's Egypt. And down below Egypt is Cush. Is this where they chased the Million Man Army? So Cush. Who did I say that the sons were? Let's take a look again. Who were Cush's sons? Seba, then Rama. Rama had Sheba and Dedan. So Seba, Sheba, and Dedan. They're all Cush seeds, seeds of Cush. Do you see that? Seba, Sheba, Dedan. Let's look. Whoops. Wrong map. Uh, let me go here. Here's Seba. Here's Sheba. And right up here is the city of Dedan. All seem to be in this part of the world. This is going to be important because we're going to see later on that Moses is going to rule Cush for almost 40 years. You know, how old was Moses when he killed the Egyptian and was found out and had to leave? We're going to find out today how he left. We're going to find out today where he went. Did he go to Midian? Did he help those, those daughters of uh, Raul right away? You know, our minds, they are foggy because there's no outline. Oh, we got an outline, but there's, there's no specifics about what happened to Moses. We're going to see Moses was trained. He was trained to be a leader in Egypt. He was raised among Pharaoh's sons. And now he's going to be a leader in Cush for many years before he goes to Raul's place, meets his daughter eventually, after 13 years in prison. Oh, there's so much that we're going to find out how this all fits together. But, you know, my little mind before I read Yasher, had Moses leaving about four years old, and he was with in the wilderness with Raul, keeping his sheep for another 40 years until he saw the burning bush, and then he came back. You think that's how the life actually went? We're going to find out differently. It's cut. There it is. I think that's the area. Now, we're going to see some things later on uh, that's going to make it look like Cush might be up in this area, but I don't know. I don't think so. I think that's where Cush is at. Let me continue. Going back to Yesher. And Moses was with was in the king's house going out and coming in. And Yehovah gave him favor in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants and in the eyes of all Egypt's People, remember, we're talking about men people, and they loved Moses exceedingly. And the day arrived when Moses went to Goshen to see his brethren, that he saw Israel's seed in their bur in their burdens and hard labor. And Moses was grieved on their account. And Moses returned to Egypt and came to Pharaoh's house and came before the king.
And Moses bowed down before the king, and Moses said unto Pharaoh, I pray thee, Adonai, I have come to seek a small request from thee. Turn not away my face empty. And Pharaoh said unto him, Speak. And Moses said unto Pharaoh, Let there be given unto thy servants Israel's seed, who are in Goshen, one day of rest therein from their labor. Oh, I think this is so interesting. You know, this is the start. And we're going to see, he's going to call it the start too. This is the start of an awakening process. You know, when I first started coming to understanding that Yahovah has a kingdom, you know, that comes gradually. I finally left the kingdom of my birth and joined Yahovah's kingdom exclusively. But there was a time where I was overlapping kingdoms. And one of the first things I did was keep the Sabbath. And I think that is something that many, many people do from the beginning, especially men. We're talking about men. Primarily, we're talking about men. You know, they have women, and their women, if they follow their men, will keep the Sabbath. There's many women who are keeping the Sabbath, and their sons, or their, their men don't want to. And I think they're overstepping their boundaries. Because Yahweh didn't tell them to do anything. He told the men to do it. So here is the men who are now getting a day of rest. Well, if the men get a day of rest, the ladies are going to get a day of rest. Leave me leave it there. And the king answered Moses and said, Behold, I have lifted up thy face in this thing to grant thy request. And Pharaoh ordered a proclamation to be issued throughout the land of Goshen, saying to all Israel's seed, Thus says the king, for six days you shall do your work, but on the seventh day you shall rest and shall not perform any work. Thus you shall do all the days as the king and Moses, ben Bethiah have commanded. And Moses rejoiced at this thing which the king had granted him, and all Israel's seed did as Moses ordered them. For this thing was from Yehovah to Israel's seed. For Yehovah had begun to remember Israel's seed to save them for the sake of their fathers. You can join Israel's seed. You can become Israel's seed. But first, you have to leave the kingdom of your birth and become a gar. And then at Passover, become an Ezra. You know, I looked for the first time that the Ezra is mentioned in Torah. Those are Israel's seed. Those are, the, those are the men who are counted as Israel's seed. Ezra men, born in the land men. And you know where the first recorded word is? Exodus 12. The Passover instructions. And the Ger becomes an Ezra. In Exodus 12, 48. First two recordings of the Ezra men. They are Israel's seed. Check it out. Just putting that out there for you. But look what it says. For this thing was from Jehovah to Israel's seed. For Jehovah had begun to remember Israel's seed to save them for the sake of their fathers. Yes. Is that what's happening right now? Someday, Yahovah is going to come back. The dead shall rise. And we're going to see changes in the earth like we've never seen before. Yahovah was with Moses, and his fame went throughout Egypt. And Moses became great in the eyes of the Egyptians and in the eyes of all Israel's seed seeking good for his people. Israel, and speaking words of peace regarding them to the king. Well, here we have Exodus 12, Exodus 2, 11 through 15. And then we're going to go right back 
for one more chapter before we leave today. Let me go through this really quick. This is Exodus 2, 10. Let me go. Uh, here's 2, 10, 11, actually. Now it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown. How old is it he's grown? Was he 40 years old? You know, we've got so many goofy things in our minds that we just have no justification for it. When Moses was grown, that he went to his brethren, looked at their burden, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked. We're going to see he's 18 right now. So he looked this way and that way. And when he saw no one, he killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. Now, he killed an Egyptian. Does anybody have a problem with that? He's seen his brother being beaten many times. But this time, he's going to kill the Egyptian? Does that make sense to you? Was there a reason behind this? Well, we're going to find out today there was. Hit him in the sand. When he went out the second day, Paul, two Hebrew men were fighting. And they said to one another, and he said to the one who did the wrong, why are you striking your companion? Then he said, who made you prince and judge over us? Do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? So Moses feared and said, surely this thing is known. Yes, he's got problems. Sar, prince, judge, Shaphat. When Pharaoh heard the matter, he sought to kill Moses. Look at that. Pharaoh is now looking to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt, look what it says, and dwelt in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a wall. Well, well from 18 to here. Here's what it, where it's going to be. He's not going to be left Cush. Oh, yeah, here. Meets Raul and his daughters. He's going to be 66 years old when he sits down at the well. Right now, it's 18. That's almost 50 years, 48 years, 42 years, 48 years. Yeah, 48 years. In one verse, they skipped over most of the life of Moses. Set down by a well. Well, we're going to stop here because we've got a heck of a lot of information to fill in between this sentence. No. It's one, you could say this sentence and this sentence. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian. He's going to flee from the face of Pharaoh. We're going to see that today. Let's find out how it happens. And when Moses was 18 years old, what do I have here? Yeah, he always saw them. And when Moses was 18 years old, he desired to see his mother and father. He saw them regularly, and he went to them to Goshen. And when Moses had come near Goshen, he came to a place where Israel's seed were engaged in work. And he observed their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian smiting one of the Hebrew brethren. And when the man who was beaten, saw Moses, he ran to him for help. And the, man Mos and the man Moses was greatly respected in Pharaoh's house. And he said to him, my Lord, Adonai, attend to me. This Egyptian came to my house in the night, bound me, and came to my woman in my presence. And now he seeks to take my life. Here is a man who has committed adultery. In a sense, he's kidnapped 
this man, bound him up. And now this man is trying to take this guy's life. What's wrong here? I put this man needed to die. Moses knows he's, he's visited Israel many times. He knows the ways of Yahovah. So as if a man is found kidnapping any of his brethren, of, the, of his brethren of Israel's seed and mistreats him or sells him, and then, then that kidnapper shall die, and you shall put away the evil from among you. Now, you could press that this is not so much kidnapping. He's not really being kidnapped. But look at the next one. If a man is found lying with a woman, it says in Torah, married to a man. Really what it says is mastered by a master. Baaled by a Baal. Oh, that's so enlightening. You know, there is no word for woman or no word for wife in Torah. A wife is a mastered woman, a Baal woman. By Baal. And she may be intimate, but even a slave is a Baal woman. Baal by a master. Baal by a Baal. So we've got to expand our thinking. But here's a man taking another man's woman. Then both of them shall die. The man who lay with the woman and the woman. So you shall put away the evil from Israel. Now this is rape. This wasn't her choice. So she's not going to die. But there's other considerations that we have to consider. There's other things that we have to consider. Here it is. And the man who commits adultery with another man's woman, he shall commit adultery with his. He who commits adultery with his neighbor's woman, the adulterer and the adulterer shall surely be put to death. Okay, now that's not what I was looking for. These are both basically the same time. Now keep in mind, this woman didn't choose this. This this rape was forced on her. We're going to talk about what I was talking about in just a second. There's a reason why this is happening. And Moses heard this wicked thing. This was a wicked thing. This man had taken another man's wife and raped him in his presence. And now he's trying to kill him. His anger was kindled against the Egyptian. And he turned this way and the other. And when he saw there was no man there, he smote the Egyptian and hit him in the sand and delivered the Hebrew from the hand of him that smote him. And the Hebrew went to his house. No, and the Hebrew went to his house, and Moses returned to his home, and went forth and came back to the king's house. Sounds a little bit redundant, I know. And when the man had returned home, he thought of repudiating his woman. For it was not right in Jacob's house for any man to come to his woman after she had been defiled. Repudiating is talking about putting away, casting off, rejecting, divorcing. Why? Here it is. This is Yehovah's instructions. When a man takes a woman and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanliness in her. And he writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house. And when she departs from his house and goes and becomes another man's woman, if the latter husband detests her, the new husband, and writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies, who took her as his woman, then the former husband, the original husband who divorced her, must not take her back to be his woman after she has been defiled, Tame, for that is an abomination before Yehovah. And you shall not bring sin on the land which Yehovah, your Elohim, is giving you as an inheritance. Now, you know, this is where the man's coming from. And probably they didn't have it spelled out in so many terms like they have in Deuteronomy. But this man is questioning whether he's supposed to continue to be with this woman. And I understand that entirely, though she was raped. 
but she's got another man's seed in her. And I think the seed is the problem here. This, you know, there's many things that are sin sexually. But what I see is seed is, is at the forefront of all of it. Sperm. I'm not going to say too much more about that right now. But this woman has another man's seed in her. And that's a problem. Uh, let me just continue. And when the woman went and told her brothers, and the woman's brothers sought to slay him, and he fled from his house and escaped. This man has had his life changed by this Egyptian. Now he's running from his own house, escaping his woman's brothers. Wow. And on the second day, Moses went forth to his brethren and saw, and behold, two men were quarreling. And he said to the wicked one, why dost thou smite thy brother or neighbor? And he answered him and said unto him, who has set thee as a prince and judge over us? Dost thou think to slay me as thou didst slay the Egyptian? And Moses was afraid, and he said, surely this the thing is known. And Pharaoh heard of this affair, and he ordered Moses to be slain. Now he knows that Moses is being slain. You know, I often thought maybe Moses turned 18, and now he's trying to make the prophecy, my mother or my father and my mother shall have a son, and he shall save Israel. He's trying to take it into his own hands. This shows me I was wrong. This is not what happened. He saw sin. He was dealing with the sin. Pharaoh heard of this affair, and he ordered Moses to be slain. So Elohim sent his angel, and he appeared unto Pharaoh in the likeness of the captain of the guard. Now, I think these two verses are out of order. Take one and switch them over. Here's the next verse. An angel of Yehovah took the sword from the captain of the guard and took off his head. The angel, Yehovah's angel, took the sword from the hand of the captain of the guard and took off his head with the sword. For the likeness of the captain of the guard was turned into the likeness of Moses. Do you see what's happening? And so now he's coming to Pharaoh and appeared to appeared unto Pharaoh in the likeness of the captain of the guard. So now the likeness of the captain of the guard is going to get rid of Moses, get him out of town. And the angel, the messenger of Yehovah, Yehovah's messenger, took hold of Moses' right hand. What does this say? 18. And brought him forth from Egypt and placed him from without the borders of Egypt at a distance of four, four days' journey. Do you hear that? What does that sound like? The angel of Yahweh took his hand and brought him forth from Egypt and placed him without the borders of Egypt, 40 days' journey. Sounds like Moses got transported, doesn't it? And Aaron, his brother, alone remained in the land of Egypt. And he prophesied to Israel's seed, saying, Thus says Yehovah, Elohim of your ancestors, Throw away each man the abomination of his eyes, and do not defile yourselves with the idols of Egypt. You know, people have to be in the right place to even hear a prophecy like this. I can't tell people they need to leave the kingdom of their birth in order to join Yehovah's kingdom as a gear. They're going to have to find it out for themselves. They weren't ready to hear it. And Israel's seed rebelled. These are Israel's seed. 
You know, I would almost argue they're not Israel's seed so much as Jacob's seed. And would not hearken to Aaron at that time. And Yehovah thought to destroy them. Were it not that Yehovah remembered the covenant which he had made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In those days, the hand of Pharaoh continued to be as severe against Israel's seed. And he crushed and oppressed them until the time when Elohim sent forth his word and took notice of them. And this is where we are going to stop today. We're going to see that Moses is going to go to Cush next week. Now we know where Cush is at. All right. Well, hey, thank you for enjoy, uh, joining me. And uh, I hope you're learning. I, you know, stay with me. Please stay with me. i got lots to share. Today I'm calling this the Moses Timeline. But I'm going to give you Abraham's timeline, Jacob's, Jacob and Esau's timeline, and Joseph's timeline, in addition to Moses' timeline. These are all research tools that you can go through the scriptures and see that what I'm saying is true. This is amazing stuff. I want you to see this. Well, I'll stop here. Catch you next week. Yahovah bless y'all. Bye now.